to the book of Matthew, chapter 16, first book of the New Testament. I'm going to take some, some verses from the New Testament that have a word in them that will repeatedly sent around the theme for the message tonight. I enjoy, it, not only in the Bible, but just in my thinking on a daily basis, I enjoy seeing things that are similar, and I enjoy seeing things that are different and being able to, to tell them apart. <clears throat> you know, God has divided things from one, one another. He's divided, he divided up the races in Genesis 10. He divided the genders in uh, Genesis chapter uh, 1 and 2. And uh, he's, he's dividing Christians uh, from uh, unsaved people. And he's going to have a great division at the rapture. Right. I hope you're on the right side at the rapture. Amen. hope that you're going up. And uh, in addition to noting divisions, by the way, it's, of course, sometimes it's hard to note divisions these days mm -hmm. as uh, people are so confused yeah. in their rebellion about what God made them. And they say, well, I'm going to identify as this. You know, you can identify it as, 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 all as, you, as well as you want it. I can identify, I think I'm going to identify myself as a millionaire and move to a fancier place in town. You can identify, but it don't change anything. <laughs> okay? <laughs> you better be sure you are what you are, honey. And if God made you uh, something, then you just try to be the best example of what God made you to be as you're able to. I'll never be tall, dark, and handsome. Okay? <laughs> I don't, I've done decided that. That's not in my makeup. Uh, as a matter of fact, I hit a peak of five foot eight. I've been going down ever since. <laughs> yeah. So handsome, though. Hey. <laughs> so <don't lie. laughs> Matthew chapter 16, we're going to begin reading in verse 21. If you brought a King James Bible, you're in the right place. Matthew chapter 16. You're welcome to come in here with any version you see fit. Okay? Like a fellow bringing, you know, a, a knife to a gunfight. You, you're welcome to bring anything you want to in here. But I believe one book. That's the book I'm holding in my hand right now. Amen. King James 1611 authorized version Bible. Amen. Matthew 16 verse 21 says, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Folks, Jesus told them what was going to happen. Yeah. 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 You see this? He told them what was going to happen. And, uh, and a lot of people these days, because they don't know how to write and divide the word of truth, they don't know how to, uh, how to make heads or tails uh, out of the fact that God revealed things to people progressively uh, through the years and through the Bible. Uh, they, they don't know uh, how and to deal with people uh, who were here before Jesus died on the cross. But the fact is, folks, there's a lot of people who were God's people in the Old Testament who had no clue about Jesus going to the cross. Amen. One of them we're going to see in the very next verse. The very next verse, Paul, the, the Lord was telling the disciples, he said, that he must go to Jerusalem. He must suffer many things. He must be killed. He must be raised again. And Peter says, far be it, did that should happen? Look at it in verse 22. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. You really think Peter was looking forward to the cross? No. <laughs> he was not. The Lord told him he was going to the cross. And Peter says, no, you're not. Verse 22. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this, this shall not be unto thee. Folks, he just lied, and he just called Jesus a liar, basically. Because yeah. Jesus told him what must, must happen. And Peter says, this shall not be unto thee. He lied. But he turned and said unto Peter, be careful, folks. You might have this be true of you sometime. You say something completely opposite of what God holds to be true. He said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Can you imagine looking at the first vicar of Rome and calling him Satan? Amen. I, I say that facetiously. We know that Peter wasn't the first pope, right? right, right. 
One way you know we know he wasn't the first pope, he just said, silver and gold have I none. Okay? <laughs> Another reason why we know he wasn't the first pope is because we have no evidence he even spent any time in Rome. <coughs> and another reason why we know he wasn't the first pope is he had a mother-in-law. Yeah. 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 Well, it doesn't say he had a wife. Come on. <laughs> if, he got, if he got a mother-in-law without getting a wife in the deal, he's too stupid to be a pope. <laughs> Verse 24. The joy of the Lord is your strength. <laughs> they said, hey, folks, I don't, we don't have to make up jokes. All we have to do is recognize the ones that are already there. Yeah, then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's real discipleship. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And uh, that's not talking about uh, the day of Pentecost starting the kingdom of God on the earth like post millennials and all millennials want to believe. I was talking about what you read in chapter 17. If you continue reading chapter 17, God gave them a picture of the Lord coming in his kingdom and in his power. And uh, you'll find that in the next uh, beginning, next chapter. We're going to read verse uh, 21 one more time for our text for the message. And if you want to go ahead and make note of it, the word we're going to emphasize uh, through this message is in verse 21. That's the word must, must. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go on to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. May we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for your blessings. We do want to do like the songwriter penned, count our blessings instead of counting our burdens. Do want to count our blessings and thank you for all you've done for us been so much better for us than we deserve. God, preserve us from being a griping, whining, complaining church. Help us, Lord, to be a praising church. Great things you have done. And Father, I pray you bless the message. Thank you for these who've come to church tonight. What a joy it is to see people growing. What a blessing. What a joy it is to see people growing in grace and becoming so faithfully to the services. Blessed by your Holy Spirit's power as the Word of God goes forth tonight. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Won't you be seated, please? For our thoughts tonight, I want you to look at that four-letter word, must. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem. The word must is found in 126 verses in our King James Bible. This is the very first time that the word must appears in the New Testament. Our Lord showed his disciples that he must go into Jerusalem. He must suffer. He must be killed and he must rise again. I want to take uh, this text and use for our thoughts uh, this evening uh, for a title for the message the necessities of Jesus. These are a number of things that the Bible uses the word must to describe our Lord. Uh, there was a, I got a, an email about a, a business meeting that was held by some Georgia preachers and they were uh, discussing about changing a word in their bylaws and, and they wanted to change the word must to shall. Like that makes a lot of difference. But some people just don't like the word must. Come on, you don't like to be told what you have to do, do you? Come on. Anybody know what I'm talking about? If there's anything you don't like to be told, it's you've got to do this. Because inside you, there's a rebellious self-will that just says, I don't know if i got to do that or not. 
we just might see about that. Some of you may not have said it when you were a kid, but you thought it. You know, when somebody told you you had to do this, and you said, I don't know about that. Our Lord showed his disciples that he must do some things, which included going to Jerusalem, suffer, be killed, and rise again. I want you to think with me about that word must. There's a must for all of us, but that's not the subject for the message uh, tonight. Tonight I'm going to speak on the must or necessities of our Lord. If Jesus had things that were must, though, uh, we should not think that God has no requirements for us. There's some things that he wants you to do, and nothing else will satisfy. Um, an illustration of this here that's still on my mind because of preaching a few messages here in our main services, teaching on it in, uh, in Sunday school on Sunday mornings, and that is Jonah thought that he could perhaps have an alternative to God's perfect will about where God wanted him to go and preach. And he said, I don't think I'm going to uh, go to Nineveh. I think I'll go somewhere else. You know what he had to do? He had to go to Nineveh. If he didn't go to Nineveh, he was going to be um, goldfish food, you might say. Great big, maybe four-ton goldfish, I don't know. But, um, but Jonah found out that, that there were necessities in his life. I want to give you tonight some absolute, some necessities. I uh, won't be able to give much time for each because we've got several of them that I want to point out uh, to you here. But I pray that the Lord Jesus might be magnified as the message will be totally about him. And number one, I want to mention the necessity of scripture fulfillment. When Jesus Christ was here on the earth and he was working and, and doing things, much of what he was doing was actually fulfilling Old Testament scripture. Right. He was fulfilling, it just occurred to me, I got the, yeah, I got this mic off, okay. He was fulfilling things that the Old Testament said would happen. And guess what? Those things must happen because the scripture cannot be broken. In one place, Mark 14, 49, he said, I was daily with you in the temple teaching and you took me not, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. Mark 14, 49, he was talking about why are you taking me now? I was here uh, telling you what all that I believe uh, and, and you, didn't, you didn't arrest me then, but he said the scriptures must be fulfilled. In Luke 22, 37, along the same lines, he said, for I say unto you that this is that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me, and he was reckoned among the transgressors, for these things concerning me have an end. I'm telling you that Jesus Christ had things happen to him in life that must happen because scripture cannot be broken. Amen. The Bible must be fulfilled. This, my friend, is the Word of God. Every prophecy that is given in the Word of God has been fulfilled or will be fulfilled. Amen. Not a single word of the Lord won't come to pass. Luke 24, 44, Jesus said, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms, concerning me. Let me just say quickly, prophecy cannot be bypassed. It had to take place. Prophecy cannot be broken. It had to take place. I'm glad to report to you that every prophecy that had to be fulfilled before Jesus Christ hung on the cross and said, it is finished, did get fulfilled. And, uh, and when Jesus said it was finished, that could refer to many things, among them being that every scripture that needed to be fulfilled in his life by his actions until he hung there on the cross had been finished, had been completed. Amen. One place he said to his heavenly father, I believe it's John 17, he prayed and he said, I have finished the work that thou gavest me to do. Amen. Another must that we find in the Bible about our Lord is the must of a submissive life. The must of a submissive life. I'm talking about the submissive life of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came into the world. He's God manifest in the flesh. But he voluntarily took upon himself, according to Philippians chapter 2, the form of a servant. Amen. 
And as a servant, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So when Jesus was walking this earth, he was walking this earth. Yes, it was God manifest in the flesh, but he was also here on a mission as a servant of God, as the Lamb of God, and being in submission even as a lamb is silent before shearers, Jesus Christ submitted himself to the Father's will. In John 9, 4, he said, I must work the works of him that sent me. Amen. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. Our Lord was born into this earth, but he was born without sin. For he must be submissive to the Father's will. He behaved without sin. For he must be conformed and subject to the Father's will. And then he bore our sins as the sinless, spotless sacrifice. He became sin for you and me on the cross of Calvary as he submitted himself unto wicked hands. A third must that I want to mention to you about the Lord was actually mentioned not by the Lord, but by John the Baptist. And this must is what I'm going to call the must of a superior position. And folks, this church will get along much better if every last one of us recognize the preeminence of Jesus Christ, right. the dominance of Jesus Christ, the authority of Jesus Christ. John the Baptist enjoyed, if you would call it that, for a time, a period of popularity as multitudes came out to him. Then there came a time when Jesus appeared on the scene months later and there were people started to leave John the Baptist meetings and they started going and following Jesus Christ. Right. They went to John about it and John said, uh, said this to him in, in a famous verse in John 3.30. He said of Jesus, he said, He must increase, but I must decrease. Amen. The best way to, for you to go up is to go down. I'm saying, he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. As we exalt Jesus Christ, we humble ourselves, and Jesus will exalt us in due time. We need to humble ourselves, and we need to hold the Lord high. I want our church to be, among other things, a church that lifts up Jesus Christ. Amen. A church that holds him high. A church that says, not our will, but his be done. A church that, that the individual members, including the pastor, are not as interested about somebody noting what we have accomplished as we are noting what he has accomplished. Amen. Because to be honest with you, anything that you've accomplished that God didn't do in you and through you, not really worth talking that much about. Amen. I don't care what it is. I don't care if you've accumulated things, if you've accumulated money. I don't care if you've accumulated a mind and education. I don't care if you've accomplished a great things athletically or physically. I don't care if you've had 100 children. I don't care what it is you think you've excelled in. If Jesus didn't help you do it, it's not even worth mentioning. Amen. Jesus, if Jesus gave you the power, Jesus provided for you, Jesus guided you, and you came out after that thing is over saying, the Lord is good. Praise him forevermore. He was the one that guided me through all of this then I believe that that might be worthwhile because you're exempt. You're exalting Jesus. You're saying, what I want to do must go down. What he wants to do must go up. And that's the secret of success. He must increase, but I must decrease. Let me give you another one. There is the necessity for of spreading the word of God. The necessity, and this is good to pass on to you and me today. The necessity of spreading the word of God I pray for the Lord to open doors for us to get the Word of God out. And then, folks, we need to step through those doors. You, uh, you preachers, I would recommend every one of you preachers, uh, first of all, of necessity, I'd suggest that you, number one, be faithful to church and be faithful to everything that every Christian in this church ought to be doing. Amen. Amen. If every Christian ought to tithe, you preachers certainly ought to tithe. Amen. 
If ever, if ever Christian in our church ought to come Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, then you preachers certainly ought to come to Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Amen? And if Christians ought to do things, then you ought to do things. But then I would pray and I would ask, Lord, would you give me something to do? Lord, use me. I believe that the Lord uh, will. There's the necessity of spreading the word of God. In Luke 4, 43, he said to the disciples, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. What a blessing for God to take our church and open up door after door after door. Amen. And we must spread forth the word of God. Amen. Thank God for missionaries that we've been privileged to support because they are part of our outreach of the word of God. I'm, I'm for anything and everything that you want to do. I, I'm, I'm not all that... Uh, I'm not all that big on people all, so, all the time wanting to do things outside the church when they go, don't go regular to the things that we've got going for the church. Okay, Get your priorities in order. But I'm all for doing everything that we can to get the word of God out. Amen. We get done with church tonight. I'll be headed to the house and Lord willing, I'll be setting up to try to uh, get the word of God out by means of internet and then it'll go forth by way of radio uh, as well. The necessity of spreading the word of God. And in, in, um, in one of the famous passages of Scripture describing the conversion of a wicked woman, known as, we don't know her name, known as the woman at the well. Y'all remember the woman at the well? Amen. The Bible says des describing, I mean, the, that's not the most wonderful side of town where he found that woman. As a matter of fact, Jews avoided that area. Right. Yeah. I'm talking about the area of Samaria, Samaria yeah. basically a place of half-breeds, and they didn't like those people. They didn't want to be around those people. They didn't want to go there. But the Bible says in John 4:4 4, 4 of Jesus, He must needs go through Samaria. Amen. Don't you know there are Samaritans that were glad that He must needs go through there? Amen. First the woman at the well, and then there were many people. They came to know the Lord through this. Through Jesus set the pattern of going. Jesus set the priority of going. Our church cannot be uh, resting on our laurels, trusting that because we have such a wonderful fellowship here and wonderful singing or whatever might draw people here, we cannot sit on our laurels. We must go out into the world Amen. and get the gospel to every creature. Paul felt this necessity when he said, Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Amen. He had a compulsion. Then another must that I want to give to you is the necessity of the sacrificial death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The necessity of the sacrificial death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Luke 9, 22, he said, the Son of Man must suffer these things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. Folks, I'm here to tell you that the devil wanted to oppose it. The flesh wanted to oppose it. The world wanted to oppose it. But it had to happen because it was prophesied in the Old Testament Amen. scriptures all the way through that it would happen. That's the only way for people to get to heaven. Right. Amen. Yep. You've heard me quote John 3, 14 through 16 many times. Most people know John 3, 16. But the illustration of John 3, 16 is in 14 and 15. Amen. And some of you remember it's the holding up of the serpent on the pole Amen. in the wilderness. You remember that? Right. Well, here's, I want you to listen to that word again. Right. In John 3, 14, the Bible says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Amen. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. The women told <laughs> Peter and John after the resurrection that somebody had stolen the Lord's body. They couldn't, they couldn't believe it. Somebody stole the Lord's body, so they took off. Peter and John running to the, to the tomb. They go in, the body is gone. 
And the Bible says that they believed. And many people think that they, they believed the gospel. They think that what they were believing was they believed in the resurrection. But what they believed was what they'd been told. What have they been told? That's what they believed. They believed somebody had stolen the body. And the very next verse verifies that, what they believe, because the very next verse, John 20, verse 9, says this. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. John 20, verse 9. Now, folks, I realize some of this that I'm giving you to you tonight is uh, hard to get a hold of because of what you've heard in tradition rather than from the Bible. But the best thing for you to do is, is believe the Bible whether you understand it or not. Amen. Amen. And just grow in your understanding of the Word of God. Amen. And the Bible says what they believed was was what the woman, women had told them. And the reason why they believe that is because, verse 9 says, for as yet, this is after the resurrection, for as yet they knew not the Scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Amen. Folks, that's not too lost people as we would think of it in those days. That was Peter. That was John, the beloved. Yeah. And they thought that, that he had been, his body had been stolen. But the fact is, John 20 verse 9 says, Jesus must rise again Amen. from the dead. For the plan of God to be fulfilled Jesus had to die for our sins, be buried, and rise again the third day. Amen. For the pardon of God for sinners to be achieved, Jesus must die for sinners. He must be buried. He must rise again the third day. And I'm so glad to report to you, hallelujah, he did. Amen. Amen. Give you a couple more. The next one is the necessity of shepherding the sheep. Jesus loves his sheep. And he knew that there were going to be sheep brought into the fold that the Jewish disciples would not have approved of. Talk about Cornelius and his bunch. I'm talking about you and your bunch. Yeah. Back in those days, they would have not welcomed the idea that, I mean, look at these fellows. <laughs> look at these fellows. If you were one of the Lord's 12 disciples, <laughs> And you saw these guys. <laughs> and the Lord said, these are going to be my precious people. Yeah. To Peter, James, and John. No. And Peter might have said, Peter might have said, I'll take you out this one. You take out that one. You take out this one. <laughs> I'm so glad, though, that when Jesus foresaw, he actually foretold them a little bit. This is before the mystery is revealed to the Apostle Paul. He said this. John 10, 16, he said, And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. Amen. And they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold yeah. and one shepherd. Amen. I don't believe that he revealed clearly what was going to happen. I believe that was revealed to the Apostle Paul, and we'll find it spelled out in the Pauline epistles. But thank God that the Lord uh, shepherded us, us Gentiles in Amen. to the body. Amen. There is a universal call to salvation Amen. that goes out to people of all colors, of all status, Amen. of all countries. Anybody that's alive is a candidate to become a child of God. Amen. Amen. Right. Amen. There's a union in Christ when a person believes on Jesus. Amen. We'll mention one other must, and that is the necessity of the second coming of Christ. It's going to happen. Amen. Has to. Yeah. It's a necessity. Right. The Bible says in Acts 3.21, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. Let's talk about the heaven. Talk about Jesus is received in the heavens now, but he's coming back. Amen. He must come back. Amen. To tell the truth, he must come back because he said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will. I will come again Amen. and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. He must come back. He left, didn't he? Amen. That's right. He left and told us that if he left, he would come back. He has to come back. Amen. Revelation. I love the book of Revelation, don't you? Amen. Amen. Revelation 1-1, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ 
which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. I'm saying the Lord's declaration will come to pass. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain in the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The Lord's departure declares that he's coming back. And let me say, Jesus doesn't save anybody apart from what he did on the cross of Calvary. But he doesn't save anybody apart from that person being willing to receive that salvation by trusting Jesus Christ as his Savior. There's one place where the Bible says that Jesus is the Savior of all men, especially of they which believe. That is, he's the potential Savior of everybody. Anybody can be saved. Amen. He's the personal Savior of those who trust Him Amen. as Savior. That's where we have that in Exodus chapter 12 about the Lamb. We have the, the Lamb, or a Lamb, the Lamb, and then your Lamb, your, lamb, your personal <coughs> Lamb. Have you trusted Him yeah. as your Savior? What must I do to be saved? The answer to that was believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt be saved. Amen. Nothing you have to do, just trust him. As the songwriter wrote it, only trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. He will save you, he will save you, he will save you. Amen. Now, stand together, heads bowed. These are some necessities of our Lord.